Our gospel reading this morning will come from chapters 14 and 15, the Passion Gospel of the Gospel of St. Mark. We're beginning now with verse 1. This can be found on page 826 of your pew Bibles. And if you're following along, and I encourage you to do, you may want to bookmark that page because we'll be coming back to it. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. And while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table and a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on Jesus' head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a, a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were greatly pleased, and they promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. You probably expect that the excitement level was still there. This big parade of people who had stood outside the entrance to the city, lining the roads, throwing their cloaks and coats along the ground as the cult with this miracle worker, this man of great teaching and power came into the city. People raising palm branches to fan his way in and proclaiming him Messiah and King Hosanna to the son of David. There had to be a palpable sense of excitement, of anticipation among all the people that were gathered in the city for this this ultimate festival of the year. Probably unbeknownst to most of them was the subterfuge among the, the authorities. How to go about getting rid of this guy without stirring up the crowd because they are definitely on his side. We just saw that. <laughs> so Jesus, when he is in Bethany, a suburb of Jerusalem, in the home of a friend with his followers and others gathered around him. is approached by a woman who is unnamed. Who takes a, a stone jar, an alabaster, a rare stone, an expensive jar in and of itself. And breaks it open and pours a highly fragrant oil of nard used to embalm bodies and to cover up the stench of death but also used to honor those who are considered the highest a way that was kings and prophets were anointed when they were given their authority and recognized as being the ones in charge this fragrant oil poured over Jesus not just a little dab on his forehead but a cup or more poured all over his head. And the room must have 
filled with this aroma. I mean, to the point where it was suffocating. Very costly ointment. 300 denarii was a year's income for the average worker in the day. A whole year's salary she had taken and poured out on Jesus' head. You can understand why the practical ones among them said, wait a minute, what a waste. A little dab would have done you. And you can sell the rest or save the rest for later or, or give the money from selling it to the poor. That's what we're supposed to be about, isn't it? Taking care of the poor. You've heard this, haven't you? We shouldn't be spending money on this. We should be taking care of the poor. If we're going to save money, if we're going to spend money, we should be spending on taking care of those in need. You see, this is kind of sets up, if you will, the big conflict that's been in the church since this very day. The extravagant and ecstatic versus the practical, the reasonable. The church has been struggling with it for 2,000 years. You need both. You need the people who understand how to get good mileage out of a shekel, out of a dollar. But you also have to have that sense of grandeur, that sense of, of vision and wonder that honors God in ways Pure service doesn't. Usually we tend to one end of that spectrum to the other. But here we have this sense of, in the very moment of an ecstatic crowd, a woman acting out of her own sense of love and devotion to this new king. That she takes something that she spent a whole year earning and offered it to him. It's a one-time thing. And others spoke about her with anger. How could she waste her money this way? She should have saved it and given the money to the poor, to those in need. Now at this time, I, I, I don't know about you, but I think this woman didn't really understand that she was anointing Jesus for his burial. Because none of them got that at the time. They thought this was the new Messiah. This was the king. Even the closest disciples had heard three times Jesus said, hey, look, what's going to happen to the Son of Man is he's going to be turned over to the authorities, arrested, tried, executed on a cross, and on the third day, come back to death. And they still didn't get it. And here in the aftermath of this grand entrance into Jerusalem, I kind of doubt that this woman had that sense that this was an anointing for a, a coming death, but she still felt this devotion, this sense that there was something about this man that she was going to devote a great part of her life to. She was going to glorify this son of David, this Messiah, King, as best as she could to do something that was pleasing to him. We can't have one without the other. We serve poor and needy and homeless and abused. Those who are orphaned and widowed and sick. We tend to those who are dying. And yet we also worship in a space that by its beauty instills a sense of the holy and the sacred. Sometimes we are human beings and we need those kinds of emotional ties to awaken within us or to remind us of the sense of the presence of God, the one who can do the impossible. We need, need not worry about the limitation of the resources. 
and always let that drive how we respond to God's call. You know, in Luther's day, when he called for that reformation of the church to restore it to its origin, there were those who took it way to the other extreme. They were called the radical reformers, and they sought to get rid of all ornamentation in the church, all stained glass windows, no candles, no books, no altar, no pyramids. That was all a waste of God's money. And it drew people away from concentrating on the poor and the neglected. On the other hand, there are some who say, we need a $65 million jet to get from our sermon to a sermon. You can see how it goes both ways, can't you? The sacred and the profane, the, the holy and the worldly, the practical and the ecstatic. Yes, we may call this woman's beautiful thing that she did for Jesus a waste but it was a holy waste it was a sacred act and we're called to be to respond to those things that draw the sacred responses from us just as much as we are called to care for those who are always among us always we'll have people in need that's what the world is. We're not called to do one as opposed to the other. We're called to do both, friends. The poor who we have with us all the time, but in those moments when we're touched by the sacred, when we are awed by the glory of God, it's okay to respond in other ways as well. Jesus turned this woman's beautiful thing, this good service she performed, he turned it into something even more extravagant. Into the anointing of his body because God was about to do a most extravagant, a most wasteful thing. By going to the cross and taking on the sins of the world for our sake, for each and every one of us. Death for life. That's pretty extravagant too. And a waste, but a holy one. Amen.